Good evening and greetings of peace. My name is Yusuf Ismail and the program you're watching is I Beg to Differ. This program focuses on interactive debate on socio-economic, political, cultural and religious issues affecting us as South Africans and certainly looking, unpacking and examining some of the global dominant trends in the international community. 18 years to the date, on September 11th, 2001, one of the most devastating attacks hit American soil. Well, 18 years later, we're no nearer to the truth, and a lot of questions have been asked over the years, including whether the evidence indeed provides or points to White House complicity. And there's certainly been a number of issues and analysis and books written on the subject. Well, joining me once again to discuss this contentious issue is an individual who has spent a significant portion of his political life and activism engaging in discussions on 9-11 in terms of what transpired on 9-11, including writing a book on 9-11, is none other than engineer and political analyst from New York, Enver Masood. Welcome, Enver. It's good to have you again on I Beg to Differ. Thank you. Nice to be here. Let's start off with this. I mean, um, it, it's 18 years to the date, um, come September 11th. What, what's happened? What's improved since in the United States? What has improved? What has happened uh, in the United States in terms of political landscape since 9-11 impacted on American soil? Well, <laughs> we have a new president that is very difficult to understand because he keeps changing his mind and everything. Uh, when he was running for president, Mr. Trump uh, said he couldn't believe that the towers came down with the uh, planes and fires. And that was recorded on an interview in a New York radio station, 9-11 itself. He's changed his position since. I mean, now he's accepted. Yes, yes. In fact, I'm told he changed his position the very next day, but I can't find that interview. <laughs> um, the, the, the official story is that, and, and maybe we may unpack it, is that in, in reality, because it's an, still an important part of a discourse, the idea that a state or a government would never attack its own population. That, that's part and parcel of the American uh, conscience, in a manner of speaking. And yet, a few yeah. months before 9-11, you had a policy document called Rebuilding America's Defenses, the project for the new American century, uh, which speaks about the ongoing intervention in foreign lands becoming an impossibility barring the advent of a new Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. That's true, but we have even more evidence than that. Uh, back when President Kennedy w was the president, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the military proposed to him that we fly a plane with Americans on board towards Cuba, substitute it with uh, a drone and shoot it down, and also shoot Americans in the streets of America and blame it all on Cuba so we would have an excuse to attack them. So this is in the archives. Uh, the J chairman of the Joint Chiefs was a Mr. Lemnitzer. This, this is, we, we have so many fa false flag attacks to go to prove the point that, uh, uh, that Americans will attack their the, the argument is sometimes presented is that was just in theory, um, but, but it never was in fact enacted. Uh, during the Kennedy administration, because such no, an act would be... That's right. President Kennedy turned that down. Um, in the introduction to the new Pearl Harbor, um, the leading theologian, David Ray Griffin, I mean, he wrote one of the, uh, well, one of the early, um, uh, well, if we could call it, uh, interrogations of the official events of 9-11. Uh, he, in fact, states that a distinction has to be made uh, a critical distinction in the field of 9-11 between cumulative and deductive arguments. Um, and and he, his whole uh, uh, thesis in that entire novel is to show that cumulatively 9-11 was an inside job. You've got other writers, for example, I think Webster Griffin Tarpley, uh, that goes and uh, presents different theories. There are different theories out there. Some theories state that you have a situation where something allowed to happen on purpose uh, something is where it's made to happen on purpose, or something is where there is actual active involvement by the government itself. What's your position in terms of 9 11? Let me answer that starting with two facts. One, fact one uh, the, 
the FBI director, Mr. Mueller, who was then FBI director, who's now involved in this investigation of Mr. Trump, uh, he, his reporter has said in a British newspaper, several British newspapers, that the identity of the hijackers remain in doubt. That is one fact. That's what the FBI director Mueller said, and he's never taken that back, as to my knowledge. Uh, this this uh, second fact, uh, I had it in my head, and I'm just trying to come back. Oh, yes. The FBI most wanted poster, you know, they had these posters of most wanted terrorists. The one for Bin Laden never claimed that he was involved in 9-11. But that's mm. to this day, they have never claimed that Bin Laden was wanted for 9-11. Those are two facts. Now, in terms of my position, being an engineer, I have to have facts to draw a conclusion. But prior to a firm conclusion, I can make uh, informed judgments. And looking at the evidence, uh, I don't see how that could have been done by the alleged 19 hijackers, 19 Arabs. The availability of the explosives that were used, the access to the buildings that was required to blow them up, all of these point to an inside job. Well, we're going we're to unpack that further, but just let's clarify this point. Um, the, the, the hijackers remain in doubt. Those names, the 19 names that were subsequently put up, I mean, the mo most famous, infamous Muhammad Atta, do you have doubts that there was an individual? Call Muhammad Atta, I think, on flight 11, or were these names subsequently manufactured at a later time? Because, I mean, well, there, there, were, there were footages. There were, yeah. there were footages at the airport showing the individual boarding the plane. As far as I know, there are no big evidence of them being on the plane. In fact, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, so the seating plan of the various planes, and that's on the internet, it was part of the FBI evidence against the so-called 20th hijacker, uh, Musawi. In those seating plans and in the uh, passenger list put out by the Associated Press and other news organizations, there are no Arabs. So, so let's start off with this. And the, the argument is, uh, in inverted commas, the official version of events, 19 hijackers hijack planes under the authority auspices of bin laden operating in a cave and flew them into world trade tower there's been other theories of course in terms of the implosion of the buildings and world trade center seven and so on and so forth the, the, the counter argument to that which i think popular mechanics brought out and which has been challenged as well popular mechanics some years later attempted to derail a lot of what it described as conspiracies and one of the points i recall them making is that if the twin towers was brought down by means of controlled implosions. What was the need in the very first instance for planes to basically uh, crash into the buildings in the first instance? Because if the planes would not bring down the building, then uh, what was the need for a plane to crash in the building if they could have brought down the towers by means of implosion in the first place? Well, uh, that, uh, if they had brought it down by implosion, they would have to prove to the public that somehow the hijack, the Arabs or whoever did it, got in there to uh, plant the explosives. How, that is almost a virtual impossibility. How would they have the time to get in there, move around, plant explosives throughout the towers? That is just impossible for so, the third party. So, so would you then see the, the, the plane crashing into the buildings as a kind of a, if I could call it a red herring or a detraction from the actual action of actually bringing down the building by means of controlled demolition to to to, to yeah, bolster see. the argument to bolster the argument that it's actually the uh, the, the the fuselage of the plane uh, reached a certain uh, propensity in terms of its uh, degrees and thereby brought the plane the building down. See, even the crash the planes, it's not conclusive that the planes had crashed into it into the towers are the planes that we're told they were. Uh, we haven't seen that evidence because if that was the case, we would have uh, the serial numbers on specific parts of the plane matched to the serial numbers of the alleged planes that st uh, struck it. I'm not saying planes did not strike. Planes did strike the Twin Towers, but we're not sure what planes they were. 
one, one thing which is, which is apparent is that on the morning of 9-11, you had, um, I think, Michael Rupert in his book, Crossing the Rubicon, points us out that, you know, within the military, within the military industrial complex and the military itself, you have these kind of so-called um, uh, mock operations that take place, what they call the games. There were things like Northern Vigilance. Um, there was a, a mock Cold War hijack um, exercise in Alaska and Northern Canada. You had a Vigilant Guardian, which was uh, the, the, the insertion of false radar blips, Vigilant Warrior, Tripod Second. Uh, there was something called the National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, there was another drill uh, that was being hosted by the NRO for the scenario of an errant aircraft crashed into the building. Now, the, the point being made by a lot of these uh, critics of uh, the official story of 9-11 is that these drills were in place in order to put off uh, the Federal Aviation Administration and the North American Aerospace Defense Command from being alert to the potential of planes, in fact, actually being hijacked. Would you see that as, um, a, a, as a kind of a, a plan in place? Well, uh, uh, there were several so-called exercises, war games going on that day. And they, uh, they were obviously intended to distract attention for the actual act that was being committed. And uh, it not only distracted the public, but the controllers at the airports and the pilots uh, flying, they didn't know whether there was an exercise going on or it was a real order. That was all intended to distract uh, the, the military themselves, except for the people involved in it. So what's your official view then? Um, and I kind of want to zero in onto that. Are you saying that it's a military industrial complex, it's um, the intelligence agencies, or are you saying that at the highest level within the administration of the White House, there was some degree of operational planning which went well, directly to the president himself? Well, my view is, my view is when I look at it, motive, means, and opportunity, that this had to have been done with the cooperation of rogue elements within the U.S. military and government, and most likely the Israeli Mossad, because, uh, that, because of the folks that had access to the buildings, the security company uh, that controlled that building. Would the deputy president back then, Dick Cheney, would the president himself, I mean, um, George Bush, many question his IQ and his awareness, and I mean, there's a famous clip in the school of Andy Card, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whispering in his ear, and he seems to display some form of shock at a nursery school, but continues with the children. Would they have known this? Would, would they have known in terms of what transpired? No, I, I don't think uh, President Bush knew what was going on. I think the, the folks that I would question, if I had the subpoena powers, would start with Mr. Cheney, Vice President Cheney. That's what I would start with. What, 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 and also the solic Solicitor General of the United States then, who was the uh, advisor to Ms. Mr. President Bush. P people like Richard, but what, what aspect of Cheney's behavior post 9-11 betrays uh, the fact that he had some degree of foreknowledge on what transpired on 9-11? Who had foreknowledge? Dick Cheney. I mean, the assumption is that, oh, that Cheney oh, had some oh. sort of foreknowledge. Um, what aspect in terms of his behavior and post-activity on 9-11 betrays the fact that he had some foreknowledge? Uh, well, there, there, uh, there is the, uh, the testimony of uh, uh, Mr. Mineta, who was, I believe, Transportation Secretary at the time. He describes the scene in the uh, Situation Room when these attacks were happening, and he describes how a young military man came into the operation room and, and he's talking about the Pentagon, that there's a plane coming towards the Pentagon that is 50 miles out. What he are, comes in again, says it's, I believe, 30 miles out. And then he comes in again, says it's 10 miles out. So here's an airliner coming towards the Pentagon. And what does Mr. Cheney do? Uh, the young man asked the vice president, do the orders still stand? 
and the vice president, J.E., uh, says, uh, uh, yes, they do. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Mm. Now, the only way to interpret that is if the order had been to shoot down what it was going towards the Pentagon, the military would have gone ahead and done it. They wouldn't come back and ask, are you still mean that? The only reason they came and asked that was because they were concerned that the plane is getting closer and closer, and uh, they've been told to, st told to stand down. Well, one counter argument, and I'm playing the devil's advocate, is that with, with that level of planning that would have been required for such an operation, with that level of sophisticated operation, bringing the kind of financial hub of the United States down, uh, attacking the Pentagon, um, what happened in subsequent in Pennsylvania, with that level of planning, the counter argument to the, what we would call so-called conspiratorial narrative is that it would take too many people to sustain such an overwhelming conspiracy to the fact that somehow or the other inevitably that information would be leaked out to the public that the fact that there was some sort of official planning and that hasn't happened to date other than of course what people hypothecate and present in critics and uh, and material and analysis of 9-11 yeah see there are so many hard facts to debunk the official report let's start with the fact that uh, no steel frame high-rise has come down from fires or by the uh, hitting being struck by a plane and the architects of the buildings themselves said that it couldn't the way it was designed so here we have three high rises coming down on 9 11 the steel frame high rises from fire and two because the plane struck the third one no plane struck mm. it and this has never happened before 9 11 or after 9 11. Well, I want you to hold that thought, um, Enver, I just want you to hold that thought. I, I've been told we have to go for a quick ad break. Uh, I have to interrupt you on that, but uh, we'll be back shortly and we'll continue this discussion. Welcome back to I Beg to Differ. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail, and we are in a fascinating discussion with um, Enver Masood, who has written extensively on 9-11, and uh, we are now 18 years to the date. The 18th anniversary of 9-11 comes September 11th. Uh, Enver, I had stopped you on that particular point, um, but, but you're making an interesting observation, and certainly as an engineer, you pointed the fact out that the World Trade Center collapses revealed uh, features of what we would call control demolitions. I mean, the towers fell uh, straight down within themselves. They mushroomed outwards into vast clouds of pulverized uh, uh, forms of uh, concrete and shattered steels. And, and they fell at a rate only slightly slower than free fall um, in a vacuum. Uh, molten steel was found at the bottom of uh, the Twin Towers. I mean, all these seem to point out to somewhat of a controlled demolition. And I believe there was a clip some years back where you had a situation of a BBC reporter reporting on the collapse of uh, World Trade Center 7, and World Trade Center 7 was still, uh, was still basically uh, up. It had not yet collapsed into free fall. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, this was a BBC reporter saying that, uh, that Building 7 has come down before it had come down. Now, uh, but the thing is, we have even more hard evidence than what the reporter was saying. The very fact is, when you look at how the two towers came down, the debris, the steel beams were being tossed around horizontally from the towers uh, for a few hundred feet. They were found embedded in other neighboring buildings. Now, if that tower is coming down, the, it'll come straight down. There's no reason the gravity moves things straight down. They don't blow them out sideways. So that's fact one. Fact two, if it came down because the plane struck it or the fire, it would not come down symmetrically as the videos and photographs show. It would come down uh, maybe a chunk here, a chunk there, and you'd be left with a crippled building standing. You wouldn't have the whole tower come down because there was no reason for the tower below the point of impact of the planes to come down at all. Uh, perhaps some of the 
towers above the point of impact would have come down. That's how it would have happened. If, if, if indeed that's what it was, the plane and the fire. So the very, any engineer or scientist or structure uh, looks at that collapse, it is impossible for planes and fire to make buildings collapse in that manner. And then we have Building 7, which is hardly ever mentioned by mainstream press. No plane struck it, and that came down uh, like the others. Uh, and, and Building 7 also was not mentioned in the 9-11 in the official report, right? Uh, the, uh, the, right. The, the, the report, um, the, the, the official 9-11 report um, that was done by these two individuals, I forget their names, just slips my memory, uh, but it was not in fact mentioned at all in any context. Um, I... You're right. Building 7 wasn't mentioned. And I want to make one correction to what I said about Building 7 coming down like the other two towers. It came down, but the, the implosion was different. It was destroyed from the bottom up. The, other, the Twin Towers destroyed from the top down. Both are controlled demolition. Robert McNamara, uh, you probably heard of Robert McNamara. He was quoted, uh, I think, just a month or two in Scientific American saying the same thing that um, you know the World Trade Center was probably uh, one of the more resistant buildings and were designed to withstand the impact of a Boeing 707 um, and I think you've got this new the new movement that was for uh, engineers um, for 9-11 truth uh, which are part and parcel of the 9-11 truth movement but popular mechanics over the years attempted to debunk that um, and, and debunk these engineers who were challenging uh, you know, the, the, these particular reports, and I think they were uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They had tried to get information from them, uh, which is the official U.S. government standard body, that were attempting to debunk these reports of these engineers as being somewhat quack, as being uh, revisionist, and not standing up to scientific scrutiny. Uh, just tell us about that. Tell us about pop popular mechanics' role, because popular mechanics well, has been popular significant in that. Popular mechanics can't be trusted. For one, the, look at the author of the report. If I remember correctly, it's been 15 years or more. Uh, it was, uh, I believe, a Mr. Chertoff. His father or close relative, I believe, at the time was director of Homeland Security. So these are all people connected to those in power at the time of 9-11. And uh, no engineer would uh, trust the credentials of this Chertoff person. Uh, besides, there's one other very telling fact. In the scientific community, when you write a paper, particularly on a, such an important issue, you present it at, at some conference of your peers. Well, these guys, they're not willing to present that at any conference of their peers, and they won't even attend a conference when they're invited to, uh, to debate the issue. No one who was involved in the writing of the official report is willing to debate the issue with those of us on the other side. In, in conclusion on that point then, your, your position is that the Twin Towers, including World Trade Center 7, were brought down by means of controlled demolition and that the plane crashes were kind of a smoke screen <coughs> to what was already in place and would inevitably yes. have happened. Yes, that's it. So, so if, as you Until say, I see some evidence to the contrary, and I've been looking for it all these years. So, so I even wrote my first article in April 2002, and since then I've not come across anything to uh, to discredit that conclusion. If, you, if, as you're saying, as as you did uh, indicate, that the passenger airlines um, were not in fact passenger airlines, a lot of people, I think the Nordia brothers, if I'm not mistaken, the first footage that ever came out on the plane crash was a day later by the Nordia brothers on the first building crash. There, there was a single footage by the Nordia brothers. But as I understand it, if it was not passenger, commercial passenger airlines that crashed into the building, then what happened to the original passenger airlines with passengers that had left the respective airports, Virginia? What happened to them? What, what, what would have happened to them? And surely the passengers would have spoken. Well, th those are all very good questions. Uh, I can point to two facts that I, I'm aware of, or two allegations at least. One is the Flight 93 that is alleged to have crashed. Uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, right? Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, the hijackers struggled with uh, some of the 
where some of the passengers struggled with the hijackers. That flight is reported to have landed in uh, Pittsburgh. And then that information was subsequently taken off the internet. The, the, the plane that is alleged to have struck the Pentagon, uh, it, it, it would have been something like the crash that happened, uh, that was pro or the plan that was proposed to President Kennedy that you fly a plane towards the Pentagon and you substitute it with something else because there was absolutely no evidence that that particular plane struck the Pentagon. There is plenty of evidence that some kind of plane or drone did strike. And there's also evidence that there was most likely an explosion within the Pentagon prior to the strike of the drone. So, so what, what would have happened to the passengers? I mean, I mean, there, w there would have been passengers in commercial airlines. What would have happened to the passengers? Well, uh, who were these passengers? We haven't been able to follow up on them. Uh, were they, uh, were they even the folks that were told they were? They could have all been plants. I mean, this is a huge operation. It's, it's boggles the mind that Osama bin Laden and his uh, companions could have dreamed up something. There was a journalist, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that um, I think she worked for CNN. Again, you know, such a long time ago, but the story goes is that there was a telephone call made on one of the airlines. And at that stage in 2001, at that level, I think Michel Chosodovsky in his book, um, The War on Globalization, points us out that it would have been practically impossible to make a telephone call from a commercial airline oh. to the ground. Yeah. Uh I'm not a communications engineer, but those who know that field have said that was not possible to make a call. And even if a call were to get through, the, the phone, as the plane is moving, it, uh, it has to send the signal to different towers along the way. And that would not have been possible. Even today, right here, I live six miles from Dallas Airport, the international airport in the Washington area. And right around my house, there are areas where the, uh, my phone cuts out. Well, one thing which is quite surprising, and I don't know if the, I can't recall now in my recollection whether the 9-11 uh, Commission report in fact dealt with this, is that federal government back then, immediately after the attacks, broke the law by the rapid removal of steel debris. I mean, if you look at the 2002 FEMA report, the FEMA, I think the World Trade Center Building Performance Study, uh, it stated that some of the steel was rapidly corroded by sulfidation. Now, you're an engineer. Um, you know, FEMA called for an appropriate investigation um, into that particular finding. But, but the deepest mystery, basically, is that on, on what basis was the debris pile uh, appeared to have been partially evaporated, and some of it apparently uh, shipped to China. I mean, th this is crucial forensic evidence from a crime scene itself. Um, there seems to be some sort of undercurrent which allows for the removal of steel debris. Did the commission report ever deal with this aspect? No, 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 they didn't. Uh, not uh, as far as I recall. The debris was removed to India and China. It also turns out that the steel beams were apparently cut to the lengths that would be easy to carry uh, or be, to truck out of there. And there were there was steel found on the site that had melted. That would not happen with a fire. There had to have been something uh, of a higher temperature to melt steel. So, so how, <coughs> And of course, you're not supposed to disturb the crime scene. That's the first rule. You preserve the crime scene. How does, uh, so, so, so Enver, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but then how does this conspiracy work with so many levels? Um, are, are you saying, for example, that Zelico, uh, who was um, one of the founders of the commission report, are you saying that they, they deliberately overlooked these aspects and that they had suspicions possibly of something which was untoward? Did you say the writers, the 9-11? I mean, the 9-11 Commission report, uh, I think one of it was um, Zelico. Um, um, if I, if I, I've, got, I've got the 9-11 Commission report omissions and distortions. Right. Okay. The, the first, 
the chairman and vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission, Hamilton and Keane, yeah. they have written in their book, we were set up to fail. This is the chair and vice chair of the commission. One of the senators, U.S. senators on the commission, a paraplegic, uh, he resigned from the commission saying it's a scam. Now, the author of the 9-11 report was a Mr. Zelico, who had written, who authored a book with Condoleezza Rice, who was then the uh, national, I believe, national security advisor to Mr. Bush. They had an interest in all the, the oil in the Middle East and the uh, pipeline. And, and I, I have to stop you there. I mean, told we have to go for a quick ad break. Um, and I, I, I will leave you, hold you on that thought, and we'll continue that discussion, but we have to be, and we'll be back shortly. Uh, welcome back to I Beg to Differ, and if you've just joined us, we are discussing and unpacking an event that happened 18 years ago. Yes, it was 18 years to the date on September 11th, 2001, that the official narrative indicates that planes authorized at some high level by Osama bin Laden crashed into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and certainly the crash of Flight 93. And joining us via Skype from the United States is none other than uh, engineer himself and political activist and author Enver Masood. Welcome back, Enver. Um, and, but, you know, been lot, there, there's been lots of material written on 9-11. I mean, there's been, you know, the very first book by the French journalist. Um, I forget his name now. There's been Barry Zwicker. There's been Webster Griffin Tarpley. There's been David Ray Griffin. Um, there's been more on the fringe uh, within the conspiracy world. David Icke, you know, the guy with the story of the reptiles and the, and the, and the Illuminati conspiracy. Uh, and then, of course, there's been... Um, some outlandish ideas. Do you sometimes have a concern that by virtue of the fact that there's so many official or alternative theories questioning 9-11, but a lot of them not consistent, um, that in fact it, 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 it um, discredits the official critique on 9-11? For example, I mean, there was, a, there was talk in the earlier months of 9-11 amongst Muslims that... Um, 2,000 Jews never turned up. I remember some years back, and I don't know if you can recall, you were in South Africa with Zafar Bangash. And um, Zafar, in fact, this was, this was, I think, October 2001 when you were in South Africa. And Zafar seemed to indicate that um, there was a letter sent to somebody in Germany who opened up a letter or some sort of correspondence which indicated that on the day of 9-11, 2,000 Jews wouldn't turn up. Now, I mean, that, that kind of argument uh, which... Which, which is problematic well, at the outset. It discredits... The full, there, there are several things going on here. One, there's a lot of uninformed people just voicing their opinion. So you have to separate the opinions of the uninformed from mm. those that have seriously studied the issue. So you have to look into the background, read their writing, and not uh, you can't listen to everybody that wants to speak out. That's one. Second, those that were part of the conspiracy want to discredit the legitimate voices, the informed voices. So they put out all kinds of erroneous stuff, hoping that those informed voices will then spread that in erroneous stuff. Well, I had a lot of folks sending me information trying to uh, lead me off the track of my own interpretation of the evidence. So that's good. And one very important point, the way to discredit the so-called conspiracy theories is to label them as such. And this label conspiracy theory was uh, recommended by the FBI during the Kennedy administration. And I have a map on my computer how the FBI was told to use this word conspiracy theory to discredit people who were uh, taking a Kennedy assassination and coming up with other issues. So we should avoid, just for, don't use the label conspiracy theory. Hmm. Address the facts. Let's move on to the Pentagon, because that, that would, um, the so-called alleged ignorance of Flight 77. If you look at the Keen-Zelico Commission, um, 
they, they claim in the report, as I recall, that the Pentagon officials were officially in the dark about the hijacking of Flight 77, which hit the Pentagon at, I think, about half past nine or 9.38 in the morning. Um, but but what, what is quite surprising is that um, um, the, the Secretary of Transportation back then, Norman Manera, as I recall, um, he testified that at 9.20 that morning, about 20 minutes prior to the uh, attack on the Pentagon, uh, he went down to the shelter conference room um, with, 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 where, where Vice President Cheney was in charge. And, and the indication is that Mineta told the commission that Cheney knew of the approaching aircraft at 9.26, at least 10 minutes before the impact of the Pentagon. But the 9-11 commission report totally left out Norman Mineta's testimony. Um, tell us That's about that. In fact, his video testimony has been removed from the internet, from the 9-11 Commission archive. Well, is it not on YouTube? Uh, was it not posted on YouTube? I have that still, but it was removed from their archive. Um, and, 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 see, that's the other thing that's happening. Those who were behind the whole affair, they have been working to try to remove all the evidence from the internet. It's a, and slowly things are disappearing. Um, and, so and, in an effort to preserve some of that evidence, what I did was I bundled up everything I had and I sent it to the International Criminal Court and I got a reply from them saying that that has been archived with them. But of course they cannot act on it unless a uh, member state requests an investigation or a security council requests the investigation. At this point, as I understand, presently the Pentagon holds the footage um, of, of what happened at the Pentagon from about approximately 84 cameras. Um, any reason why the um, commission never asked for the camera footage? Because, I mean, the only footage we've got is uh, the explosion. What happened prior, um, what happened subsequently, there's nothing else. No debris. Um, the, obviously, the fact that Hani Hanjo, who was the alleged pilot of uh, Flight 77, was so incompetent, according to some reports, that he was refused... Um, a rental of a single engine uh, Cessna, um, the fact that um, that angle of turning and, and more importantly the anomalies in terms of what struck the Pentagon. If the Commission yeah. did have the, the, the power to subpoena uh, camera footage and the camera footage did in fact exist, why didn't they do that? The, the commissioners who were appointed, mostly the commissioners are lawyers, most of the uh, congressmen and senators are lawyers. Most of them don't, they come and they may be very bright in their fields, but they have not done this type of thing. They're there to rep represent their political interests. They, they can't really do an investigation. An investigation of this type has to be carried out by a multidisciplinary team. And the, they only saw and heard witnesses that were presented to them by the st staff director, who was the Zelico fellow. Uh, who, whose uh, expertise is in the creation of myth. He's a professor. It, so uh, the, the information given to the commissioners was controlled by Zealot. They had no chance no, to, to think uh, beyond the little uh, bit of information that they were being given. The, the, the trouble They're I have... Not, uh, engineers and scientists who even think differently. The, the, the thing that I have is that within the South African context, we've got legislation such as what we would call the PIRE Act, in short. Uh, if there's information that we wish to access from authority uh, or government, I do understand that within the U.S. legal system, there are mechanisms and processes in place in terms of which you could approach the courts and, the legal se and there are certain procedures and checks in places in terms of which you could invoke certain processes to get the information out there in the public sphere. I mean, has that never yes, been that, done? Why has that not been done? Um, that, and, that's, and, called the, that's called the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, the Freedom of Information Act. And, that's it. Freedom of Information Act. I mean, certainly there's a lot of individuals right. invoked. What have the courts said on that? Well, uh, there are researchers who have tried to get that information. There are, uh, to my knowledge, the information uh, requested from the Pentagon about all those cameras. I don't think that was ever fulfilled. Uh, I have seen some information that was released, but there's got to be a lot more than what's been released to the public. So, so as, it, as it stands, that's self, classified, you know, right? 
I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with uh, the Pentagon for some information. And uh, no, sorry, the State Department. And it took me five or six years to get that information. It's supposed to be done within uh, 90 days or something like that. Um, so they, 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 they just put that request off. And there's nothing you can do unless you have a lot of political clout. Uh, the, the, the one other aspect um, in, in this entire talk, and, and it's just such a vast, um, it's such a vast uh, kind of a sinister web of so many nooks and crannies that just one program would not be sufficient to deal with this. But um, prior to that, I mean, um, the, the talk about the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Agency uh, having been set up by the uh, CIA, and the story goes is that a few months prior to 9-11, uh, General Mahmoud, in fact, arranged for hundred thousand dollars to be wired uh, to the alleged uh, lead hi lead hijacker before 9/11, and apparently had meetings with George Tenet, uh, who was then the head of the CIA, um, um, uh, shortly before 9/11. Uh, uh, did you see any kind of substance in those in, in that perspective? Well, uh, there are so many interesting allegations and facts. Uh, what I try to do is focus on those that facts, hard facts, that would lead to some conclusion, which is what I do in my book, 9-11 Unveiled. It's free on the internet. Uh, we, could, we could spend <laughs> hours and hours talking about all these peripheral facts, and I certainly don't have them at my fingertip to recall immediately. <laughs> um, I, I just wonder, before going for the ad break, um, the leading neocon organization um, calling for a new Pearl Harbor, the project for the new American century, is that, is that, is that still, um, I mean, is the organization defunct? There were some of the leading hawks prior to Bush um, coming to power. Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, um, Dick Cheney, who was part and parcel of that whole movement, um, the so-called neoconservatives that, that, that formed part and parcel of the Bush administration subsequently. I mean, what, what's the status of that organization at this point in time? Well, I think uh, that, that project for the new American century, PNAC, I think that was disbanded after they came out with the report. Of course, all the authors I call that report, I believe most of them, if not all of them, are still alive and they're still pushing for another war. Uh, what with Iran now, and uh, they want to strangle Venezuela, which they are doing. So those guys are still around. Uh, Enver, we're going to have to go for a quick ad break, and uh, we'll be back for our final segment discussing and unpacking 9/11 with a lead expert, Enver Masood. We'll be back shortly. <music> Welcome back to I Beg to Differ, and if you just joined us, we are in our final segment um, in conversation with uh, political analyst and engineer Enver Masood. And I mention engineer because certainly he made an engineering analysis of what brought down the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. Welcome back, Enver. Enver, you know, in the United States, and certainly I've had somewhat engagements with him. One of the individuals that comes to mind is Norman Finkelstein. Um, you have people, for example, on the left like Noam Chomsky, I wouldn't say John Pulger to a certain extent, um, Naomi Klein, Ariana Huffington, and so on. Um, but when, when you look at someone, for example, like Noam Chomsky, um, Noam Chomsky has been um, the kind of tour de force of the left in terms of challenging power for the past, what, 50, 60 years, since the 60s, since the Vietnam War era. And, and, and certainly, you'd expect people like Noam Chomsky um, and, and others like him, Finkelstein as well, for example, um, uh, Naomi Klein, um, and, and so on, to be at the forefront in terms of unmasking uh, the nature, the, 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 the whole monstrosity of what really transpired at 9-11. But when you look, for example, besides emotional considerations, when you look at his official story on 9-11, he effectively channels the same view. I mean, most of those on the left channel the idea that um, effectively when you see the war on Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, all these are just simply blowbacks, blowbacks for attacks by the East attacking the West. I, wh why has the left 
Um, why hasn't there been an alliance between the 9-11 truth movement and the left? It's somehow the other strange, uncanny alliance with the 9-11 truth movement, and you've got nutcases like Alex Jones and um, uh, people like Glenn Beck and so on. But those guys were speaking out against injustice for decades and not in the forefront of providing the critique. Why is that the case? <laughs> that was a long question. Uh, <laughs> Why, why is no Chomsky and Fulton? Well, well let, let, me, let me try and summarize this. What I'm trying to say is this, is that the gatekeepers of the left, those on the left who generally provide critique against the admi administration, against empire, have generally been silent in challenging uh, the official event of 9-11. When I spoke to Norman Finkelstein years back, I think probably a decade ago when he was in South Africa, and I asked him about his alliance with the 9-11, he tried to ridicule the whole movement. He said, these are like kind of conspiracy quacks and so on. Why has there been an undermining of questioning the narrative by the left? Uh, I think there are two reasons. One, e even those who have been outspoken throughout their lives, even they have what I call sacred cows coming from India. And these are the people that support them, that fund them, and even the most outspoken organizations have some organizations they don't want to go up against. Second, I think a more important link is it takes a lot of effort to come to the sort of conclusion that I've come to. I spent uh, roughly half my working time over eight years to come to my conclusion and to write that little book. So, they don't necessarily have the time or the expertise to get into all of that. And if I were in their shoes, I also would not speak out unless I could be on firm ground, not just listening to what others are saying. How, how, so, important, how, how important do you think it is for generations today? I mean, th th there's a new generation entirely, the millennials born in 2000 that were probably infants at the time of 9-11. How important is it for them to be aware of these anomalies in the so-called official version of a 9-11? Well, th things are changing. One, the younger generation is, has been reading more of what's available on the internet. Uh, that's one thing. Second, they're seeing the effect of all these wars that the U.S. has been launching around the world, how it's kept funding from things they need, like health care, infrastructure, uh, and how it's ruining the American economy. So the whole, they're waking up. A very good example of this is now they're talking about white radicals and white terrorists. I wrote about those about 20 years ago after the Oklahoma City bombing of the Barba building. None of the mainstream media would use that phrase. Now, because of the, uh, the shootings in uh, El Paso and Dayton in the last week or so, they're talking about white terrorism and white radicals. So the, the world has changed, and it, it, it'll take some event that we possibly can't even think about that'll change the whole conversation. Strange, it's strange that you mentioned El Paso and um, what happened in Ohio, uh, but, but, but those on the far right are already speculating that these are false flag operations as a means to control, uh, to engage in gun control by the state. I mean, do you see any kind of basis for this kind of outlandish idea? Well, that's, that's always possible. That's always possible. We don't know. See, <laughs> we have to accept that there are limits to our knowledge, regardless of how hard we try and how honest we are. And we have to be ready to uh, walk back what we said, which engineers are used to doing. Engineers are used to debating, coming to conclusions. And then when new evidence comes up or new facts come up, uh, engineers are used to changing their uh, decisions. But the one thing I cannot change is how the, those towers came down. There's no way towers can come down from a plane strike or a fire with steel beams go, be blown out horizontally and come down symmetrically and suddenly all at once. That is a that is hard fact that no amount of... Uh, other information can contradict that. So, so you're an engineer, and this is a point I want to drive home. You, your point is that an airplane, uh, even if exploded, could not lead to such a temperature whereby the steel beams of a building like the World Trade Towers 
could collapse in free fall under that level of heat. Is that the idea? Is that is that the point you want to drive home? Well, if the government agency that investigated that said the temperatures were never high enough to melt the steel. Uh, the, the, the central fact of those towers coming down, one, let's assume they fire and the planes could bring them down. They would come down a bit, a piece at a time, not suddenly, all at once. They wouldn't have beams going out horizontally. And there would be no reason for the structure below the point of impact to come down. That would certainly point to... Those facts, the no matter discussion can change these facts. That, that would certainly point to controlled demolition. The question is, and I want to wrap it up, but the point is that controlled demolition would take weeks to prepare. Surely, people exactly. entering the building and leaving the building, I mean, they would have been seen that something is up. Yeah, and those, uh, those buildings, uh, there are reports that they, for certain two weeks or three weeks, the security systems had been turned off, that some of the folks in the building reported uh, noises or things going on in the building that they were uh, didn't know what was going on and the security company that ha had controlled the building I believe one of Bush uh, relatives was on the board of directors of that company secure a sec that's the name of the company yeah yeah this is so many issues I forget we never even came to Larry Silverstein's uh, comment about pulling World Trade Center 7 down there's so many issues but uh, just uh, lastly, if, if, if people out there want to study the subject, I understand your book, and I want you to discuss your book, uh, where to get it, but what would you say is a standard reference work on 9-11 as a kind of a starting point to those who want to investigate 9-11 and unpack and explode what really transpired? Well, if, if you have the time, read David Ray Griffin, but he's got about 12, 15 books on the subject, and it's very hard to digest all that. The New Pearl Harbor was his initial book, right? Uh, I recommend mine because it's a good point to start from. It's brief. You can digest it in a reasonable amount of time. And not only that, if you download the e-book and click on the section headings, you get to the evidence. So just so tell us qu quickly you how... Can, it's, uh, you can spend the rest of your life investigating. How do we get access? How, 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 how do the public get your book? How do we get your book? Is there a website? Could you give us a website? We'll put it on the screen. Yeah, just, go, just Google 9-11 uh, unveiled in my name and you'll, it'll come up. You just... So, it's nine, on, so you go to Google 9-11 and Enver Masood. Right. And your book's available on PDF online. Yes, yes. You just free to download, you free just, to download. Do you have a website, Enver? Do you have a website that uh, uh, yeah, viewers can the uh, check? The website I have is the Wisdom Fund, which was set up in 1995, uh, twf.org. So it's www.twf.org. Right. Which they will get the books on 9-11, the book on 9-11 that you've written, that's yeah. available. The other book, The War in Islam, that's also available, right? Yes, they're all free. Um, lastly, if there's a message you want to drive home to South African audiences who are removed from what happened uh, 18 years ago in your country, what would you say to them? Well, for the South African import audience, and also for the American audience, 9-11 has been used for so many military uh, initiatives overseas. And for South Africa itself, there are so many military bases now in South Africa, U.S. military bases. And the hard fact that was reported just a few days ago is that there's more killing going on in South Africa since the U.S. went out there to protect South Africa. Well, it's certainly something we need to look at. I want to thank you for your time, Enver. It's been a great pleasure and privilege having you. We hope to have further engagements in the near future. And if you've just been watching us, we have been engaged on an interesting and fascinating discussion on 9-11 with none other than Enver Masood, who has written a book on 9-11. He's got a website, The Wisdom Fund. And if you want to access his book, simply go on Google, 9-11 Enver Masood, and you'll be able to download absolutely free a comprehensive discussion on what happened on September 11, 2001, 18 years ago. That's all we have for this evening. Um, uh, join us next week for more interactive debate. I'm your host, Yusuf Ismail. Till then, greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum, and have a safe journey. 
wherever you go.